getting the exposure to grow your small wedding business can be difficult. With millions of engaged couples using The Knot to plan their weddings and find vendors, advertising on our sites will connect you with more couples than anywhere else online. Meet engaged couples where they're already searching for vendors like you. And let us deliver leads to help you grow your business. Visit vendors.thenot.com slash podcast to sign up today. Mention code PODCAST15 during your free onboarding session for 15% off your first month. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 194, an interview with Sally Mott Freeman about her new book, The Jersey Brothers, a missing naval officer in the Pacific and his family's quest to bring him home. Salimont Freeman was a speechwriter and media and public relations executive for 25 years. She is currently board chair of the Writer Center, the premier independent literary center in the Mid-Atlantic, and also studied Renaissance literature at the University of Exeter, England. So, Mrs. Freeman, thank you very much for being with us today. My great pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So before we jump in, I, I'm, I don't mean to embarrass you, but I'm going to gush a little bit. This was one of the best World War II books I have ever read. You've got everything in there, including the kitchen sink. You've got, uh, you've got Pearl Harbor, FDR's map room. You've got the Philippines. You've got the Enterprise. You've got the various naval and, and air battles. You've got the Japanese with their allied prisoners and their treatment and, and why they treated them that way. I mean, you've got everything in there. And for someone like me who doesn't need a general you know, broad stroke book of World War Two. I absolutely enjoy this and the emotional connection that you that you make with by using the family, your family, uh, by yes. reading the story was an absolute amazing experience. I think it took you ten years to reach research this five hundred page book. That is correct. Uh, my original purpose was to solve sort of a long repressed family mystery of what happened to uh, this uncle, my father's youngest brother. Uh, who was unaccounted for at the end of World War II, and it caused quite a bit of angst in um, in my father's family, um, uh, his his siblings with his parents, etc. And um, my own siblings and I would sort of have a parlor game growing up. Well, we thought this happened, no, but so and so said that happened, and it was never, uh, you know, it ne- the explanations never squared, and I just decided to find out once and for all what did happen to him, and it took me on sort of a globe trotting odyssey into archives all over the world, and uh, military archives domestically, and also to attics and basements where. Um, Colleagues of each of the brothers, uh, Benny was on the USS Enterprise, mm-hmm. Bill set up the White House map room for President Roosevelt, and Barton, who it's really no secret to say that he was wounded and captured um, after the initial attacks uh, uh, on the Philippines by the Japanese in December 1941. I, I found colleagues of each of these um, brothers, and um, they all had archives that it's not the kind of thing you find online. Right. And it was it, it and it, it also led me to other individuals and other archives that made it possible for me to speak very personally uh, in each of these that uh, you know about each of these individuals and the venues and the conversations and sort of the sentiments that um, they were experiencing uh, during the war. Now, I'm going to get you in just a moment to describe that one particular night where you heard, you know, the, the, uh, the glass was shattered and, and there was an argument. Obviously, that was the, uh, the subject of Barton that caused tension in the family. But I, I just wanted to ask real quick, I think your family's from the East Shore or New Jersey, but you graduated from Sweetbriar. Yes. Um, my, again, it's, it was my father's family of origin. He grew up in New Jersey, and uh, he, of course, became career Navy, uh, retired as an admiral. He was a lawyer also. He was the judge advocate general um, from 60 to 65. And, um, and so by the time I came along, 
uh, I was the fifth of six children. Mm. Uh, we were living in Washington, D.C., so I grew up in Washington, D.C. Uh, I did go away to Sweetbriar College, yes. Yeah, that's and, 20 uh, minutes down yeah. the road for me. I take my girls there all the time because they because the campus is so beautiful. Oh. We just dri- literally just drive around and look around. It's absolutely gorgeous. Oh, my there. gosh. Where are you? Where do you live? I'm in Nelson County, Lovingston, Nelson County. Oh, for- Crying out loud. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Yes. And well, I, we'll have to talk about this after that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really neat. And I well, think, I got a college for your girls. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, <laughs> I was here for the big drama when uh, they were able to save the school, and it's an amazing story. But, yeah, we can certainly talk about that. Was your mother... Yes, and I was. I yeah. actually was part of the group. We, we formed a nonprofit, and I was one of seven that say, you know, that we hired the law firm and we right. took it all the way to the Virginia Supreme Court and we did, we saved the college. I yes. mean, basically. So good for you. So what do you know? Little local color there. Exactly. So I, th- I just think that's so cool. I can't wait to tell my girls. Was your mother born in Charlottesville, Virginia, or did I read that? No, the the connection to Charlottesville is, uh, again, sort of a, a grown up connection. Mm. Um, uh, my my mother actually um, is from Massachusetts. Okay. She's from Boston. My father, of course, from New Jersey. And um, they met uh, shortly after the war. He was stationed in Washington. And she, by the way, during the war, had worked on the Manhattan Project wow. and uh, in Boston at MIT. And um, when uh, so they lived lived and we were raised in the Washington area. Mm-hmm. And um, two of the siblings um, went away to Saint Anne School, which is in Charlottesville. I was one of them, my older sister another. And uh, my parents eventually retired to Charlottesville. My brother went to UVA. And so we, we, um, uh, we just, I guess we, you could say we migrated south at a point. <laughs> so, which was fine with me. <laughs> it's, it's just so, I mean, I keep reading about your background, I'm like, oh, Charlottesville, this is so cool. So, anyway, okay, so enough gushing about that. I do want to touch okay. on one more thing uh, about your father. I'm sitting, sitting there reading the book, and, and, and if I'm not mistaken, this is your first um, published novel. First published book. Yeah, yes, it is. It is my first um, sort of uh, book length work. I mean, I've been a writer my entire career. I was a speechwriter for uh, the F- an FCC commissioner and later its chairman, and then I became the news media chief uh, at the FCC, and then went into. I was an executive for a public relations firm, and all of these positions, of course, require extensive um, writing, but this is my first book length work. Book length work. Amazing. And so I'm, when I'm reading your book, and uh, you are throwing out nautical terms left and right, uh, detailed stuff about the Navy, but then, I, but then I realized, I mean, your father, you probably heard these terms. This is probably second nature to you. Yes. Yes. Not only was it my father's professional life, but it was also my parents' social life. They mm. would have friend, Navy friends over. I mean, this was our, we were, this was a total immersion. They would come over. <laughs> we would go on trips with them. We would visit them. Um, you know, we don't look up ships online because we had a full, we had all the Jane's Fighting Ships books in the library and we knew where to find them. And um, so, yes, I would say that that was a huge leg up for me. Yeah, because that that's always been my weakness, uh, just all stuff nautical, naval, and whatever. And by the time I finish with this, I'm like, oh, so much so, it makes so much more sense. So for all you listeners out there, if you if you're looking to brush up on your navy terms and stuff like this, but this is just one more thing this book will do for you. Okay, so let's let's jump into this. Great. The the night that you and your cousins uh, were playing, and you heard. A, gr- a glass smash or whatever, and then I guess the summer vacation is abruptly over. Could you could you give us yes. that story, please? Yes. Well, uh, when we would visit my grandmother's home in New Jersey, um, which was named Lilac Hedges, it was this sort of sprawling, um, it was sort of a farm estate and a Victorian home, and mm-hmm. we loved our uh, annual summer trips up there. We would We had a cousin that lived there, and we, of course, loved playing with him. And this was in the early 60s, and we were playing in the side yard, and we heard voices rise. We heard the name Barton again. We heard um, uh, maybe an invective or two, and, of course, we immediately started eavesdropping, and it was an argument about 
what happened to this youngest brother, and there was, seemed to be some disagreement about, you know, was it something that, that, that the Navy knew about, could have prevented, wow. was it, um, what, were the Japanese to blame, and it was a very heated argument, and um, I remember my mother was crying, and we left the next day and forfeited our annual trip to Asbury Park, which was unfortunate, uh, but um, but but that was the kind of tension that um, always sort of permeated the household when this subject came up. Um, it was obviously terribly upsetting to my father, and I think the reason it was terribly upsetting is that this was the youngest of uh, three brothers, and in fact the firstborn in a second marriage and the namesake of my grandmother's um second husband, and the older brothers, Benny and Bill, were, were really curated a role to take care of Barton, who was seven years Bill, Bill's junior, ten years Benny's junior, to um, sort of protect him. He was born prematurely, and this was a role that they played from their earliest memory. Bill and Benny graduated from the Naval Academy. When Barton eventually got to the Naval Academy, he bilged mm -hmm. after, uh, after two years for um, a fractional failure on a math exam, seven one hundredths of one point. And he finished and got a business degree at the University of North Carolina. But by that time, uh, he the mandatory draft um, had been signed into law. And my father stepped in. By this time, he was fairly senior uh, at Naval Intelligence in Washington, and he arranged to, uh, for Barton to get a commission in the Supply Corps, which I think, um, I don't know that anybody said this out loud, but that it felt like a safe commission. It was an officer's commission, of course, but the Navy had other plans, and they needed Supply Corps officers in the Philippines also, and they were um, ramping up uh, their defenses there sort of belatedly in, in November of 1941, and Barton was sent to the Philippines, and he hadn't been there two weeks before he was wounded and, in fact, captured from the hospital. So my father felt a certain degree of responsibility since he unwittingly, of course, mm -hmm. Um, uh, in an attempt to keep him out of harm's way, you know, it basically led to, um, you know, his being sent to the Philippines and, and, and his wounding and capture. Wow. And, th and that was the source of the tension between my father, who was, of course, career Navy. Benny retired. My father was still career Navy at the time of that argument. In fact, he was the Judge Advocate General at the time of that argument. And, um, and, you know, very proud of his job and great at what he did, but, you know, when when the subject of the Navy came up when we would visit New Jersey, I mean, the you know, it would sort of devolve into a conversation about this. Right. I imagine the Navy jag is not, ha is not used to having people yell at him, but when it's your own mother. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I think actually in this case it might have been um, instigated by um, the fourth of the of the siblings, which was um, my aunt Rosemary, mm. and um, who really was never the same after uh, she lost her her brother. It was her baby brother. They were very close, mm. and um, and I, I I think it may have started with that. Here's a question for you: What would you do to save humanity, and how far would you go to stop someone? Who is getting in your way. The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil, but it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins versus Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more.
Gotcha. So in the book, you are very forthright and honest, and you know because all families are complicated. All families have their dynamics and dysfunctions. Yeah. Whereas um, Barton, the youngest, uh, the the uh, of, of the second, uh, he's the youngest child. He's the uh, the second husband. I mean, sh- he is Helen's favorite. The two older boys do very well. Uh, they get through the Naval Academy. Um, Barton has his issues, and so Bill, who has been doing this from day one looking after his brother supposedly gets him a nice, you know, relatively safe um, position within the Navy and the supplies. And, and then suddenly it all goes uh, to hell in a handbasket. So he's, right. he's got this guilt. I mean, he, his, he knows he's not his mom's favorite and now he's done this to her favorite. I mean, yes, he must've just, yes, she was thrilled when he got the supply corps yeah. commission, but then when he was sent to the Philippines, she wrote him and said, there you are at Roosevelt's elbow. I want his orders changed. And of course, <laughs> You can't do that. I mean, you can help arrange for commissions if there are only so many, and you walk it around, you know, the Washington bureaucracy, and and he was well-liked, and he was respected, and so she was thrilled uh, at that point, Mm -hmm. Uh, but um, this was a fierce matriarch, and I, frankly, was a little bit afraid of her when I was growing up. So was I. And she... (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. Um, And... and, uh, I, but I, I understand now the dynamic that I was dealing with as a young child was I was dealing with a, 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 a woman that was still mourning a loss. Mm-hmm. And I know this is going off topic just a little bit, but could you give us uh, a sense of um, Bill, William, uh, your father, the middle, the middle brother, um, his time in the map room and, and kind of how that came about and what his responsibility was? Yes. Uh, so my father was um, in in naval intelligence when um, at at, at Pearl, you know in December of 1941, mm-hmm. and at that time, uh, let's see December 1941, December seven, obviously, and then um, Winston Churchill, of course, um, immediately made plans to visit Washington uh, because um, he wanted to make sure that um, the 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 struggle against the Nazis um, was a priority once um, uh, the U.S. entered the war, and and uh, of course the American public was outraged over Pearl Harbor, and he knew he had to um, immediately visit. He stayed at the White House and and convince Roosevelt that Europe first strategy. Right. So um, at that time, Winston Churchill brought his entire. Um, uh, set of traveling maps. He had the map room, of course, beneath Westminster mm-hmm. in London, but when he traveled, he brought an entire set of traveling maps, and he set it up across the hall at the White House, the second floor of the White House. He set it up uh, when he visited the White House in December of 1941. And Roosevelt, Roosevelt and Churchill had a, bit, a little bit of a competition going, um, <laughs> and uh, Roosevelt turned to his aide, and he said, you know, you need to set me up a map room like, like like Winston's, and and in fact, um, the prime minister lent Roosevelt um, one of his aides to get them started and sort of to you know set, lay it all out for uh, your listeners who are in England. Perhaps you've been to the war rooms um, beneath uh, Westminster. It's pretty fascinating, and and it was set up in a similar fashion, uh, and then. Uh, a Robert Montgomery, who was a young lieutenant and, uh, uh, of course, also a famous movie actor, right. ha- had worked for the attaché in London, but he was American, and he came and he sort of helped with this temporary setup. But uh, they knew they needed a permanent, you know, someone to, to sort of oversee the map room, which, which by the way, initially was, a, was for all naval affairs, mm-hmm. but eventually it became, you know, kind of the epicenter of... Um, of Allied decision making, um, and included all the army theaters, uh, all the land, if you will, theaters of war, um, where uh, Allied and Axis mar- armies um, and supply lines and so forth were, were mapped right. out as well. And so, uh, when Robert Montgomery he wanted um, his crack at hunting for U-boats in the Atlantic, and they went over to Naval Intelligence to try to. The, I will say the white, the, you know, the uh, president's White House aides who didn't apply for a job like this, mm-hmm. and my father, who had not only worked in, 
in cartography and in communications, but he was perceived as very discreet. Uh, he, they also um, thought because he had um, an eyesight deficiency that he would not be uh, sent to the front. They wanted someone there for the duration of the war. And, um, uh, and so that was a, a factor. And so he went. Oh, he was tapped to to set up, finish the setup of the map room, and um, hire um, um, watch officers, both on the army side and the navy side. And it was run 24 hours a day. It was a it was guarded and locked. It was also a room where all of um, President Roosevelt's communications with cables primarily, with um, Stalin and Churchill and uh, Chiang Kai-shek and other Allied leaders um, were maintained, and um, that's how it came about. That's amazing. I'm just going to mention this one time because it's it's funny, but also just an insight into someone. Uh, it seems like your father uh, was a little bit smitten or something with, with Madame... Chink, I don't know. Oh yes, oh yes. Well, <laughs> you know, she was very nice to him, right. and and uh, and he just thought she was wonderful. He thought she was beautiful. He thought she was smart. Mm-hmm. Uh, the White House staff did not really <laughs> like. Uh, Madam Chiang Kai-shek, because when she wanted something, she would clap her hands. Uh, and, I mean, I mean the people that, you know, sort of the housekeepers and so on and so forth. But um, but my my father uh, maintained a friendship with, um, with Madam Chiang Kai-shek and, of course, the Generalissimo, and uh, when, in fact, went to visit Taiwan when he was JAG, and um, he returned with a sleeve of her watercolors, which we had around the house, and also um, some china, you know, some, some vases and so forth. And, right. and, and in one of those, I retrieved a letter that was kept in one of the vases that my father sent my mother while he was visiting in the 60s, re- recollecting um, what she was like and how she really hadn't changed. That is astounding. Just, just a little tidbit. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah. Okay. So, so you've got Bill. You got William, the middle brother. He's like he's like your uh, uh, like his mother said. He's at the elbow with the president. Um, Pearl Harbor comes along. Uh, the Philippines are invaded, and suddenly no one has an idea of where Barton's at. Um, s- something's going to be happening now. Bill can access a lot of information, but it's only if it's knowable. But he certainly does his mother's bidding, and obviously he wants to know what happened to his youngest brother. So he starts, to the best of his ability, his search for young Barton. Yes, yes. And I I know that because my own sort of search as an adult began when I found a stack of his confidential correspondence files beginning at Naval Intelligence going all the way to late 1943 mm-hmm. when he himself did go to sea with the um, amphibious Central Pacific Force that, you know, did sort of the island hopping campaign all the way to Japan's doorstep. But, uh, and I, I found letters there to the, the, the captain of Barton's ship, uh, which was um, a, um, a submarine tender. He was in the submarine service and uh, for, you know, and they, the tenders, of course, the Asiatic Fleet, which was stationed at, um, in the Philippines, had a large staple of submarines, and he was on, uh, on one of the three tenders that um, oversaw their maintenance, which was significant. And, and But my father couldn't find him. They couldn't reach the captain of the ship. Of course, uh, the Asiatic Fleet was ordered out right. because MacArthur's bombers were um, destroyed on the ground, and there was no air cover, and they... they were Admiral Hart immediately um, recommended they sortie to Australia. And the, at this point, and this was during the attack on Cavite Naval Yard, uh, Barton basically was left behind and went to Kanakau, which was the base hospital at Cavite, and uh, then was moved across Manila Bay because they knew the Japanese would return and sort of finish off the job, and the ha- hospital itself was next to a packed munitions depot, and so he was moved over to Sternberg Hospital in Manila, where they listened to the radio, you know, to KZRH um, basically chronicle the approach of the Japanese from the city um, uh, by the tens of thousands. General MacArthur ordered all Americans, uh, and actually Filipino Army as well, to Bataan and Corregidor, and the, the Army wounded at Sternberg 
Pittsburgh were removed from the hospital and um, taken down to a Red Cross ship and taken to Australia right before Manila fell, but the Navy patients were left behind. That's and they were captured on New Year's Eve, December 31st, 1941, with the skeletal Naval Hospital staff that had come with them from Canacao. They were the first to be captured in the Philippines. They were the only American unit remaining in Manila and, in fact, were interrogated by the Kempatai because they thought that the only thing their bandages concealed was their true identity as spies left behind to do reconnaissance. Yeah, because it doesn't make sense. Why would you take all the Army Army personnel and not take the Navy? Uh, I tried right. to figure out why they were left behind. Do you have any theories? Um, you know, I, I actually think that um, MacArthur perceived the Sternberg Hospital was a, was an Army hospital mm-hmm. initially, and I mean, it eventually inclu- included to take civilians. And I mean, once once the attacks took place, but it was uh, specifically an Army hospital. Right. And I I believe that he issued this order, thinking uh, that that was what was within his purview. It could be the one time he, 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 he remained within his purview. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and, but, but all the nurses and doctors were astounded. They kept saying, what about the Navy patients? What about the Navy patients? And I learned this. Um, this was a gap in my understanding when I started out um, on my quest. And I, but I found an oral uh, history interview with one of the Navy nurses through Bureau of Medicine and Surgery, mm-hmm. and that led me to the entire medical archive of the of the patients, the Navy patients that were being treated at Sternberg and their capture and where and how they were treated and where they went. All of the doctors and corpsmen and pharmacist mates and so forth, they all had to keep daily records. And I stumbled on that after contacting the uh, Bureau of Medicine and Surgery um, a- about this Navy, former Navy nurse's interview, and that led me to this tremendous archive. That's amazing. And, and I just have to mention this one point. Um, God, there's so much to cover, but it was such, it was such a great story. So he's, he's writing to his mother right before the Japanese come, or rough, you know, before the Japanese come. And it's a very short, terse letter. He doesn't want to be babied anymore. He's, he's 23 years old. He wants to be his own man. I just, maybe that wasn't the smartest. Exactly. Movie ever he made. had a telegram. <laughs> yes. He had a telegram sent from the Army and Navy Club. He hadn't even found, uh, permanent housing yet. He was staying at the Army and Navy Club in Manila, and he had the nurse in the hospital on Christmas Eve send a telegram to his family in Monmouth County, New Jersey, to say, Merry Christmas, all is well, don't worry. Oh, God. And he and the nurse asked him, why would you do this? This may be your last chance to communicate with your family. And he said, you don't know my mother. <laughs> Uh, you know, I because she'll try to pluck me from the war zone and so on and so forth. And so he intentionally sort of left out mm-hmm. that he had been wounded and was in the hospital and under treatment. Right. Yeah. When you're when you're 23, it's you see life different. Right. <laughs> but um. Absolutely correct. So his brother is Bill is in the White House. He's doing everything he can. Um, but the Japanese do come. They do uh, take the the uh, all the people that are left at uh, the hospital prisoner. We're going to get into that in just a moment. But um, at some point, Bill is going to say to himself, "I c- I can only do so much from here." I have to get out there. It's killing me. It's tearing me apart. That's my my you know my youngest brother, whatever. But if you could just give us a couple of mo- moments since Pearl Harbor, what what Benny, the oldest oldest son, has been up to? Yes. Now Benny graduated from the Naval Academy in 1930. My father graduated in 33, and he drew a an aircraft carrier assignment, which was sort of a disappointment initially because, of course, the battleship. Uh, was the ruler of the seas at that time, but he was happy to get an assignment um, because many 
many in the class of 1930 did not get commissioned into the Navy because of the Depression. Right. And the Depression had uh, an effect on the services just as much, uh, you know, as others. But he did get uh, an assignment on the USS Lexington and was eventually transferred to the USS Enterprise. And, of course, the entire Pacific Fleet was moved from the west coast of California to um, Hawaii to sort of deter uh, Japan's expansionist zeal, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so he, and they were on assignment when Pearl Harbor was hit. They actually were on a secret mission to uh, take uh, the Marine planes to Wake Island. They, They were also worried about Wake Island, and they were trying to sort of amp up its defense. And they came back to, um, they actually approached the harbor on December 7th. Their planes went ahead to sort of prepare for the birthing of the carrier, and their planes tangled with, uh, the Enterprise planes tangled with the Japanese in view of the harbor. And Enterprise was immediately dispatched to search for this fleet. They were still, you know, um, maybe a hundred miles from from Pearl Harbor, but the planes had gone ahead of them. So, but they did not find it. They returned to um, they returned to Pearl Harbor, which was still, you know, clogged with wreckage and floating bodies, and the water was aflame. Uh, they got there at night and immediately resupplied and uh, returned to see um, more searches, and then they went on to prevail and uh, hit-and-run raids and some of the most lopsided um, naval victories in um, American naval history against what was then the most powerful fleet in the world, which was the Japanese fleet. That's amazing. Um, But he was also writing home and trying to get information about Barton because Bill and Benny, of course, were very close, and Benny being physically closer um, and, uh, you know, with ThinkPack and so forth, uh, you know, was trying to glean as much information as he could as well. And they were corresponding back and forth about this, as even as Bill was trying to find out from Washington. And I, um, I've just, I have just so many visit, vivid memories from, from when I was reading the book. Um, and this might not be the appropriate time in the, in the, the appropriate timeline, but I just remember Benny you know, with, with the uh, with the anti aircraft guns and just wave after wave after wave of Japanese bombers just coming down, trying to. I mean, the yes. Enterprise had a charmed life, if you will. Yes, yes. Um, uh, it was the galloping ghost of the Oahu coast because every time uh, after every battle, the Japanese would say that they had sunk the USS Enterprise, and of course, the Enterprise would hear this, and they, you know, the crew would hear this, and they, you know, they. they sort of took that as a as a good omen. Mm-hmm. And I think the battle you're referring to, of course, there were several. Benny kept um, eyewitness accounts, written accounts of every single battle, which, of wow. course, was a, a huge um, leg up from me. It was, you know, from the anti-aircraft officer's perspective. But mm-hmm. the battle uh, of Santa Cruz um, was, um, I think, they sustained the, the greatest number of aerial attacks at, you know, and then and 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 then survived to boot. And after the Battle of Santa Cruz, um, October of 1942, they were the only aircraft carrier left in the Pacific. The the new carriers were had not yet rolled off the assembly lines um, uh, on the home front. They were working on it, and Enterprise sort of limped back and from repairs again and again and again, and then went back out. It, that was in the struggle for Guadalcanal canal that's sort of wow. toward the end of it but it, it quite quite a remarkable story of resilience in itself so you have this strange juxtaposition bill is in washington it's killing him he, he needs to get out there he needs to uh, find his brother you've got benny who's out there it's the lone carrier he's got to be exhausted at some point he needs to go back and just recuperate because he's just you know f- i guess physically and emotionally and, and mentally just like everybody else on the on the uh, enterprise just needs a break and so they're going to end up you know one's going to go out to the pacific and the other one's going to trading come back. places exactly but so you've got yes. this going on but give us an idea of at, during all of this what what has been happening to barton so um Barton was captured, of course, from his hospital cot, and they were moved around Manila. The patients were moved around Manila. 
even as Bataan and Corregidor held on for months. These were the only captives at this point. And, um, but he, uh, there were so many um, of his fellow prisoners and also doctors that said he was tremendous for morale. He, ha- he mm-hmm. kind of found a role for himself. He'd always been sort of the recipient of goodwill right. in his life, and he um, ironically found a certain measure of freedom as a prisoner because, he, you know, it was the first time in his life where he had an opportunity for self-determination mm-hmm. to help others, to um, sustain morale, to um, organize um, when, when food and water and medical resources were shrinking. He would um, he sort of galvanize the other prisoner patients to help the, the weakest and um, to recover. And he sort of got a reputation for that. He also, you know, he was sort of a Rudy-like character, if you've seen that movie. Right. I've often described him as that, where he was not he was not a large individual. He was, of course, born prematurely, and his older brothers were much taller than he was. He was maybe 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, and, and as a result, you know, the Japanese, if you had a much tougher time if you were, if you were a six foot five Texan right. than if you were, you know, um, more their size, if you will. And mm-hmm. he also, he'd gotten in a lot of scrapes in his life. He got sent away to boarding school. He got sent for a year to the Citadel uh, in South Carolina, then two years at the Naval Academy. And he would seem to always be getting out of scrapes here and there. And the, the reason he went to all these places is that this is what his parents wanted for him. Right. And it really wasn't maybe what he was ideally suited to do, but they kept trying to um, push him toward that sort of eventual professional pursuit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and he, he, he was always getting out of scrapes of one kind or another. And in prison camp, uh, you know, that, that training... Um, that training served him well. <laughs> the uh, the school of hard knocks, ironically, came, came, in, came the in school here. of hard knocks. He was well trained. He was also hazed uh, mercilessly at the Citadel. He was hazed mercilessly at uh, at the, the Naval Academy. There is a strong record of that, and and you know, in the early going, it was very hard for these prisoner patients, but in his own recollection and sharing with his fellow prisoners, it wasn't as bad as being hazed. Right. Wow. Everything is relative. Uh, You do do a great job in the book of basically what you just said. I mean, his character has a chance to come out. And so for his parents who were worried about him, it turns out that he, you know, a pretty solid guy, a natural born leader, he was able to step outside of himself, think of others. I mean, they would have been very proud if they had seen that. But obviously, the conditions it took maybe to bring that out or by the time it was able to come out, he's suffering. Now, I, I'm, I'm an American citizen, obviously. And it, when you were talking about the treatment of the Ameri- of the prisoners by the Japanese, it's it's hard not to get worked up by that. The emotional the emotional yes. connection. But but you make a very good point. They did not sign. Was, was it the Geneva, Geneva Convention? Yes, they had refused to uh, to um, sign the Geneva Convention of 1929 because of its provision that uh, that family that family members be notified if a if a soldier were captured or had surrendered, mm-hmm. and because of uh, the Bushido Code, which was taught to every Japanese boy from a very early age, they were instructed that surrender or being allowing yourself to be captured um, was the worst thing that you could do. You brought shame on your family, yourself, you brought shame on your family, and you brought shame on your country. There, you know, that's why in all of these island raids, these final bonsai charges or these ritual suicides in caves and so forth, they did not want to be captured. They did not want to surrender. And and there was a cultural chasm between the Japanese soldiers who watched these uh, prisoners, you know, hands up surrendering. Right. Um, to them, the, that type of individual deserved the harshest possible treatment. Right. And um, it was just a cultural chasm is really the best way to put it. And uh, these prisoners, I mean, 41% of American prisoners of the Japanese died in captivity compared to 
2% of American prisoners of the Nazis. That's, that's just astounding. And even as an American now, I hear what you're saying, but I just can't wrap my head around that cultural divide. Um, but, yeah, but, but when I you agree. look at it like that, uh, they were treating these people with contempt because that's what they were taught to do. But just the, the yes. depth, the, uh, the, I don't know, the depths of um, purposeful suffering that they, that they meted out to the Americans was, I don't know, it was, it was, sometimes it was hard to read. Yes. Yes, and um, y- you know, my my goal wasn't to uh, bring up old disputes about sure. the Japanese. By the end of the war, they had basically murdered 17 million people. If you start with China and the rape of Nanking and so on and so forth, 17 million people died at the hands of the Japanese. But the war, of course, was much longer for them. They started, uh, uh, you know, late 1930s. But mm-hmm. um, it was very difficult for me to get my head around it as well. And in talking to survivors of that war, um, the, 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 the dividing line between those that were able to go on and lead productive, even happy lives, and those that devolved into alcoholism or took their own lives was their ability, their capacity, individual capacity for forgiveness. And uh, it was very interesting because they were all basically subjected to the same treatment. Mm -hmm. Uh, And none of them felt that, um, you know, there were no reparations, there was no apology, uh, there was, uh, you know, they felt that the reprisals against the Japanese at the end of the war were too soft and, of course, American public policy was was much keener on preventing the Japanese from falling uh, into the, you know, falling into communism hmm. than they were, you know, being overly punitive for these outrageous, um, basically, acts against humanity that they committed throughout World War II. So, so you've got um, Bill is eventually going to head out to the Pacific. Benny is going to come back. Barton is just trying to survive. And in some, like you, you point out in the book, he's, you know, he's finding himself. He's finding out what type of person he is. And in a couple of minutes, I'd like you to touch on maybe his um, relationship with Charles. Oh, Armour, uh, yes. Yeah, there we go. A R M O U R. Thank you. But, but back at home the matriarch is is sending out letters like their artillery shells to everyone she could possibly <laughs> think of get you know where's my boy could you tell us a little bit about that please yes and then they would and, and they wrote her back i mean yes, she so my my grandmother helen cross uh was a highly educated woman at, at a time when only 3 or 4 3 or 4 percent of women in this country went to college she went to college she went to wellesley she was um uh, she was assertive. She, she she was anything but the gender. Um, anything, she did not subscribe to the gender roles of her era. Right. She was not the war mother rocking um, on the front porch waiting for her son to come home. <laughs> she uh, she you know made. She made inquiries. She wrote letters to uh, senators, congressmen, the secretaries of the Army and the Navy. She wrote to Roosevelt. Roosevelt wrote her back. She wrote to Admiral Nimitz. Admiral Nimitz wrote her back. And, of course, here was my father um, running the map room. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the letters that Helen wrote to find out about where her son was were were unwittingly sent to Bill to to respond. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so... He would say, "Mother, you know, you're. I'm. I am giving you the very best intelligence available. They. Don't, I know more than all of these people because I am here. You know, with this high security clearance, I'm telling you that he is not on any of the casualty lists. He has been captured. We're waiting to hear from the International Red Cross about where they are and how they're being treated and so on. But she just couldn't bring herself yeah. to stop." And fortunately, she left a wonderful archive of this cannonade behind. Uh, and also, um, I, uh, my dear cousin in New Jersey, Barton, the namesake mm-hmm. of um, Barton, the, the um, Supply Corps officer, found my grandmother's wartime diaries and brought them. And, of course, I had a working draft right about, I had finished and, you know, kind of had, I was cleaning up 
a, you know, a finished draft, and he brought me those diaries, and I knew I had to start over and weave in her voice. Because even though she was a fierce matriarch, she was also a very sympathetic character and a mother. And um, the diaries really showed a, a very private and, um, you know, struggling side mm-hmm. of, of her personality. Yeah, the, uh, the diary entries, I mean, you just feel her suffering every day. Yes, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do yeah. the garden and I'm going to do that. But you just feel it. It's palpable. And she had to deal with that for years. And, and it's a good thing she was made of stern stuff because she certainly had to be. So it just yeah. pick up with the story a little bit. So America, we're gearing up for war, obviously the industrial giant that we are. So we're putting out ships like like, like crazy. And so the, the tide turns and uh, Barton, um, the Japanese have got to be realizing that, you know, I guess they're going to have to move the American prisoners or whatever. We can't let them, you know, be rescued or whatever. But so as the war turns, that's obviously a very good thing. But then again, that indirectly threatens Bart, Barton's and the other prisoners' lives. Yes. And, and, the, and the, the tide of the war was turning in the Pacific and, uh, something else happened, too. They were moved to a camp in uh, the southern Philippines on Mindanao, mm-hmm. and there was a an escape by several officers, Army, Navy, uh, and also two convicts who had been imprisoned at this place to guide them through uh, the... Um, the rainforest and the jungle to get them in the, they finally intersected with the Mindanao Filipino guerrillas who got them to safety and they made their way to Australia and were debriefed at MacArthur's headquarters. And this was the first news of um, the Bataan Death March. I mean, until these men escaped and got back to Allied territory, no one knew that these atrocities had been taking place. Oh my God. And all of them, you know, wanted to tell their stories. And for a long time, the war censors muzzled them. They were afraid, well, frankly, what they were afraid of. This was during the final, the seminal final planning of, uh, of the cross-channel invasion of Normandy, and mm-hmm. they were afraid that if this information got out prematurely, that the American public would be so outraged right. that they uh, that that it would threaten this Normandy invasion and doing that first, and that they would want to redirect policy to uh, the Pacific. Eventually, the information was released, but for, but um, but. Certainly after that escape, these prisoners were dealt with much more harshly, which, by the way, the escapees knew would happen, which was one of the reasons they were anxious to get this information out there. And once they did, there was a highly covert uh, rescue mission planned to rescue these men, 2,000 prisoners uh, on the island of Mindanao, the southernmost island of the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And I won't, um, I don't think I should go further to say what happened with that, but that's a thread in the story as well. Yeah. um, When we got uh, to this part of the the story, my blood pressure started going up because there's a, I can't remember his name. I apologize, but there's a gentleman in, in D.C. He's like, I can get these guys out. I can, you know, send me over there and through political. Yeah, Harold uh, Rosenquist. Yes, yes he was you. a. Yes, he was a highly. Uh, he, he was in a highly classified position. He'd been working on escape and evasion for downed airmen in the uh, European theater, and when one of these escapees met with. Uh, uh, Captain Rosenquist, he said, why aren't you operating? He was incredulous. He said, why aren't you doing this in the Philippines? He said, because we didn't know what was going on until you men brought word out of how bad it was. And he, he said, do you think we can get these men out of this prison camp? It happened to be a lightly guarded prison camp. And Harold Rosenquist said yes, and, and, and he was immediately dispatched to uh, Australia to plan the rescue mission of these prisoners. Right. Now, I know we're getting up close to where we don't want to give too much away, but the, right. the political infighting between the various branches of the Army, I mean, I was screaming at the book at a couple of, between MacArthur <laughs> it's amazing. and the Army. I mean, these are people's lives, and they're worried about their turf, their territory, being in the yes. history books. Goodness. Yes, I think that... Um, uh, you know, I didn't set out to, um, uh, you know, I, I've read a lot of books that, that 
their their mission is to take down General MacArthur. Uh, you know, all I did, I spent uh, weeks going back and forth at the MacArthur Memorial Archives, where all the documents are, and interviewing numerous people, of course, and um, the actions taken by him, and also by his sort of he had a very psychophantic. Um, uh, personal staff around him, mm-hmm. and their goal was to restore his reputation uh, after having to flee the Philippines under humiliating circumstances. Mm-hmm. And anything that threatened that return, these men uh, went out of their way to try to scuttle, including wow. the possibility of a rescue mission. That's insane. Uh, I'm sorry, that's just insane. Uh, but yeah, so it would it affect is. him. It would affect his plans. Now we're gonna we're gonna skip over Barton because uh, I mean that's the whole point of the book. You were looking to find out what happened to your uncle. But I just want to spend a couple more minutes. Uh, so the American the American naval forces or the American forces are coming closer to Japan. Obviously, um, the prisoners have to be moved if they're to be maintained. I think I read that uh, the idea was maybe to take them to Japan so they could work in factories because the Japanese obviously aren't going to give up. But I did not understand, and maybe it was done intentionally, that the uh, the transport ships the Japanese were using were purposefully, I guess purposefully not marked, uh, carrying prisoners of war? I I That is remains a mystery, why they did not mark those ships. Because... Uh, they also had their own personnel on those ships. They had food. They had supplies. Why they would not mark any of them, yeah. any of them. Um, perhaps, you know, it was a mis- you know, misunderstanding about what they needed to do or why. Mm-hmm. Uh, remember, they were not Geneva Convention signatories. But it is quite remarkable that they did not mark those ships. Do you, I'm trying to remember the, some of the statistics of how many... Allied and or American POWs were killed by American weapons because we didn't know. Uh, I think the estimate is that 20,000 Allied soldiers, so it's British, American, Australian, um, and a um, few other countries, but predominantly, heavy, heavily predominant mm-hmm. American soldiers and sailors, right. uh, were, were killed in during their by American planes or submarines uh, during their exit from um, occupied territory back to Japan, not just from the Philippines, but also from uh, parts of China um, and uh, you know the men that that um, the Burma Road um, construction and so forth. All of these men were moved around in the hulls of these ships, and they were targets. Yeah. And not not only did the submarines have, um, you know, they had they had adva- the sonar had improved, and so on and so forth. They also had code breakers aboard, mm. and they knew when these ships were were departing and where they were going. And so they would, um, you know, they would have these sort of wolf undersea wolf packs that would lie in wait for these ships, even though they were traveling in convoy. This did not protect them, mm. and um, they were destroying entire convoys. The order was to destroy all exiting shipping from occupied territory. Hmm. Um, the thought at the time was that they should, um, you know, that they were carrying war personnel, they were carrying um, all kinds of raw and other materials, guns and so forth. They, were, they knew that the Philippines, for example, was um, on the brink of um, being retaken, and they weren't just getting uh, prisoners of war out, they were getting their own uh, people out those that you know were still in the Philippines. They were uh, getting all kinds of supplies and so forth out. And the at the time, the Allies, the order was to destroy all exiting shipping. Yeah, and uh, just yeah, they were following orders. I've got your book in my hand, and I'm looking at the pictures. I mean, these POWs. I mean, the word yeah. emaciated mm. doesn't even begin. I mean, you, I can count 
the bones. It's shocking. Yeah. Right. I know. It's <sighs> shocking. Um, let's, if we could, please, because it's almost been an hour, and I do appreciate your yes, time of course. so much. One more thing I'd like to cover before we go. Um, obviously, um, uh, Barton and all the other men, um, they're barely being fed. They're not being treated very well, purposefully. Uh, they're being moved around, and like you said, they were in holes of ships. It gets over 100 degrees. So, so obviously, a lot of them are dying, regardless of what the Americans or the, or the Japanese are doing. But... Y- so, so things are obviously aren't aren't going well for that because we we you know they don't know where they're at, so they can't rescue them. Um, right. You helped me understand so much more by the time I finished this book. Truman's decision to drop the uh, bombs. Yes. So if you yes. if you could get, I mean, as far as and my everyone, father's role. Yes, yeah, if you could, if you could, because I'll just say this real quick. I mean, FDR had already decided. It was already decided we were going to invade. Yeah, we're going to lose X amount of men, but it's already been decided FDR dies. Truman, to his credit, says, we need to look at this again. If you could just kind of give us that story, please. Yes, of course. Um, uh, So Roosevelt died in April of 1945. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, they had not, I can't remember if Okinawa, uh, if if they had invaded yet. But in any case, Okinawa uh, was this long, protracted uh, slaughter of uh, tens of thousands of American uh, personnel, and, it, and it, it was a protracted battle. It went on for, I think it was intended to last maybe two, four weeks, um, and it, it, was, it dragged on for months mm-hmm. before they really had control of the island, and the slaughter was incredible. And this was right at the beginning of Truman's unbidden pre- presidency, and he called his senior staff together and said, uh, I do not want this invasion of Japan to be one Okinawa from one end of the, um, from one end of the home islands to the other. Yeah. Um, I, need, I want casualty estimates for what an invasion of, of the home islands would cost us. He said, I want to make a decision about how to end this war with the fewest additional American casualties as possible. Well, this threw the Army planners for a loop because there had been a pre- preliminary decision um, at the at the most recent, you know, Allied War Leader Conference, right. um, that they would proceed with invasion plans uh, for Japan. You know, I mean, there were there were plans and there were plans. I mean, the hope was that they would be would surrender mm-hmm. before this. But you you have to plan for an invasion. And it's complicated. So the plans continued, but they had not submitted any casualty projections. Uh, and when they met with Truman on June 14, 1945, they did not give him accurate casualty projections because if they had, right. they knew, and this was primarily the Army planners and Admiral King, of course, who was the CNO at the time, complained about it. Uh, if they had given the accurate projections, I mean, for example, they had ordered, uh, I think, another 600,000 Purple Heart medals. And the number of body bags they ordered. That that the, there were there was evidence in their planning that they were expecting a large number of of casualties because this was going to be a uh, this was going to be a, um, a a beach defense. They were going to come out. They were going to fight to the last. There were, one of the decrypted messages said there are no civilians left in Japan, right. and uh, and so Truman left for Potsdam. By by now it's late June, and. All of these decryptions uh, about what Japan was planning um, and and the things that they told him in that June 14 meeting, um, appear, you know, were immediately um, being debunked. The decryptions were saying that they were they had a huge suicide arsenal, mm-hmm. that they had um, uh, they were tar- going to target the amphibian vessels. They were um, they were going to be of such balsa light construction that radar would not be able to detect them, which would have rend- rendered useless all the all the techniques that they had used in all the other island raids um, for protecting against um, uh, kamikaze attacks, and 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 then there further decryptions, which by this time my father was at sea. He was with Admiral Turner, who was the am- amphibious force commander, mm-hmm. uh, and. And they all of these 
all of these in, intelligence decryptions are going to Manila only. They're going to MacArthur only because he had a whole separate apparatus for gathering intelligence. He did not want any Washington tether to his own intelligence gathering operations. But Admiral Turner became aware of them, and the new projections that were coming through just by the sheer ratio of fighters mm-hmm. allied to Japanese, that, that the new projections were something like six to 800,000. And he turned to my father and he said, you used to be a naval aide in the White House. I'm going to give you these casualty projections and you need to get them to President Truman. So my father immediately packed his duffel and he was off to Washington and delivered these casualty projections, which which he, he got to Truman at Potsdam through Admiral Leahy, who was the uh, chief of staff by that right. point. Mm-hmm. And also during the trip, uh, to Potsdam or and at Potsdam, the um, nuclear testing in the Alamogordo Desert had proven successful, and the combination of receiving these, uh, you know, stratospheric casualty projections and finding out that the nuclear tests had been successful, mm-hmm. that's when Truman decided um, that he would drop the bomb as soon as they could get it to Tinian and on a plane and um, and off to Japan. And by the way, yeah. with regard to the casualty protection, so let's say it was onward up to a, a, a million potential casualties. There were there were two phases of the invasion um, uh, that were planned. Um, that doesn't include the number of Japanese casualties because, as we discussed earlier, you know there was a no surrender um, um, no, no surrender mentality, mm-hmm. and they were going to. They were going to defend their home island to the death. So if it was a million American casualties, it would have been many more Japanese casualties than that. Right. So that was the decision-making that, um, that was sort of the underpinning of the decision-making um, for the, about the decision to drop the bomb. It was all about the casualty projections. Uh, uh, yeah, and, just, and, and by the way, MacArthur refuted those casualty projections. He said, he they're not true. I reject them. We need to have this ground invasion of Japan. He wanted that ground invasion of Japan. And he was furious that yeah. these casualty projections had leaked out of his own command area in Manila. And, and that is a matter of record. Right. And he wanted the invasion because he would that would have set his name in history. I mean, he would have been yes. the returning hero, I guess. Yes. Yes. He was... Yeah, yeah, he had those issues, sir. <laughs> War is a team team effort. Uh, anyway, so um, I think we'll just uh, stop it there. And now, for my listeners, we've only covered like 35% of the book. I mean, this is 500 pages of details. I mean, it's, it's just so much here. We could talk for four more hours and still not cover it. But, uh, Ms. Freeman, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And just to let everybody know, uh, your publisher sent me a copy, but I also got a copy on Audible. Uh, the reader does an incredible job of really drawing you in. Yes, Cassandra words. Campbell. Yes. It's really, really she good. Me. So I enjoyed that a lot. That was 16 hours. And so, ironically, it took you 10 years to research. It took me five days to read it, but five days, I just just really dove into it and learned a lot. And Ms. Freeman, I just want to thank you very much for all my listeners. It's the Jersey Brothers, a missing naval officer in the Pacific, and his family's quest to bring him home. Ms. Mott, I Ms. Freeman, sorry. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yes, Noah, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about it. Call me back if you have any questions. Mm-hmm. And um, I have a Facebook page if um, yes. readers want to reach out and ask additional questions. I've really enjoyed my um, colloquy with with um, people I've met at readings and um, uh, all over the country. And it, but, uh, to the last one, people have people have come up to me and said, either you know their father was a was a medic on Guam, they were at uh, the Philippines, they were on Okinawa or Saipan. It's it has really tapped into in what I am seeing is that it's tapped into this national consciousness about what happened to my relative uh, when he was here. Uh, when, you know, when he returned, he never talked about it, or he never returned. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and they want to know how I went about um, my research. And I said time and again, you know, these archives were 
hugely helpful military national uh, um, libraries uh, you know in in other countries and so forth but talking to um, um, with the war colleagues of everyone in this story and and getting their own archives which are will, are to be found in no library the the letters the unpublished right. memoir the the diaries and so forth this really allowed me to go into much greater depth and i enjoy answering questions and helping people um sort of research their own world war 2 legacy so the jersey brothers an incredible story and an incredible family I'd like to thank Mrs. Freeman one more time for being on the show and for her excellent book. Um, you can find it anywhere that you normally buy your books. There's Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, I'm sure your local bookstores. Also, please consider the Audible version. I found that very satisfying to listen to. And just to let my listeners know, I did have several ads planned for this episode, but um, I think we got in such a flow that I did not want to disrupt it. So um, there will be another episode coming out in a couple of days that will have the ads that was meant for this. So for my wonderful listeners, just bear with me. Thank you everyone for listening and please check out her book. And as always, take care, everyone. What a beautiful day in nature. Take it from a little bug like me. Nothing makes you feel more alive. <laughs> oh, whoa, <laughs> I almost got frogged. That was a close call. But boy, do I feel capital A alive. Luckily for you humans, Nature's Way put that thrilling feeling of aliveness in a bottle. Nature's Way Alive Women's Multivitamin Gummies with 16 vitamins and minerals. Delicious multivitamins inspired by nature. <laughs> whoa, better luck next time, pal. Nature's Way.